You're listening to Oilers Nation Radio, presented by the Nation Network. Subscribe for free on iTunes, <laughs> SoundCloud, oh, or wherever you get your podcasts from. Someone's rusty. I, it's been a while. It's been a did minute. You, did you not see your Chuck's cue there? He did a little yeah, wave for you. I was let you know. Your Chuck doesn't make cues. He just sits there and he looks at himself in his front-facing camera on his phone. He's either taking pictures of himself or his feet. Yeah, he's always taking pictures of his feet. He's trying to launch a new website. It's got to be one of those panoramic ones, right? He's got a kick account, and he is selling pictures of feet. So I believe he calls colors. them Yerem Chucks. Ah, I see what you did there. Ooh. Ooh. Dance pun today. Hello. Sponsored by our friends at Sherwood Ford, the giant. Welcome to Others Nation Radio. We are going. We are doing this a day early because tomorrow is the NHL draft, and we've got stuff to talk about. We're going to do a little preview, but first, I want to th- thank our friends at Sherwood Forward for making this all possible. Go ahead and follow them on Twitter at Sherwood Forward and on Instagram at Sherwood Forward the Giant. More importantly, they've got a very important fundraiser coming up. Dan, tell us about it. Yeah, so this Saturday, uh, the Nation Truck will be participating in what they call the Race for the Cure. Now, the name's a little bit deceiving because it's not actually a race. Um, everybody will meeting, be meeting up. I believe it's at the Aviation Museum, um, and uh, they'll be heading down towards the uh, down towards the the uh, legislature grounds. Jesus, that's easy for me to say. Um, they'll be, uh, they'll, but the, what they'll be doing is they'll be taking kids from the stallery and uh, and giving them kind of a special experience, a, a trip down uh, down there with uh, with some unique vehicles, some helicopter rides, that kind of thing. And uh, yeah, so it's and the, and all the money that we raise is going directly to the stallery. So uh, so yeah, we right now as this podcast is recording, we are sitting at eighty six percent of our goal. Is that the nation team? That is the nation team. We have just raised just over one thousand seven hundred dollars, trying to get to that nice. two thousand dollar mark. And uh, yeah, it's uh, it should be a lot of fun. I think Jay the Squire will be driving the truck this weekend. But uh, yeah, you should come check it out. Head on over to both Sherwood Ford social media on Twitter at Sherwood Ford and on Instagram at Sherwood Ford underscore the giant and on the nation's Twitter and so and Instagram account. You can find the links. Help us get to our goal of two G's. Thank you to everybody who's made a donation so far. Yeah, Let's raise good. some more money. You guys are all fantastic. Now, I want to start off today's podcast on a sad note. Yesterday, one Jesse Pugliarvi. These rumors have been going on for a while now, but yesterday they kind of got cranked up a notch when his agent came out and said, if he does not get traded, he will play in Europe next year. He will not play in Edmonton. Now, my first person I want to start with is, of course, Rick. He is our second in command in terms of the Dusty Parade. Dust, uh, Dusty Nielsen. Uh, did I say Dusty Parade? Dusty, dusty, parade. dusty parade. Well, Dusty Parade would be What's a, a Dusty Parade? I don't know, but I'll definitely be going to a Dusty Parade. Who wouldn't go to a Dusty Parade? I meant the Jesse Parade. <laughs> dusty is in Vancouver for the draft this weekend, so I'm going to start with Rick. Tell us about this Jesse Pugliarvi rumor. What's going on with our boy? Well, I think at the end of the day, what you, it comes down to he's, he's an emotional young man. You've seen how big he smiles. You know how big he can frown. He's had not the start to his career he's wanted. Uh, there's been some issues on both sides, I think. I don't think the organizations handle it exactly perfectly. Uh, at the same time, I think there's a couple things he could do a little bit to improve things. But we're sitting here talking about a guy who just turned 21, so we're talking about a kid. I really can't blame a kid that much when you have this many adults around who should be helping lead you down the proper road. At the end of the day, I know he's frustrated. I know he wants to play. I really don't understand why the new GM, new coach, doesn't come off more as a fresh start for him. Uh, We've never really gotten into that. I don't know if maybe his agent has something to do with that or if there's something in his head. But to me, once we got the new coach, the new GM, I figured, you know what? Your best bet, even for your career, even if you do want to leave, would to be sign your qualifying offer, come out, prove to everybody that you can play in the league, prove what you can do on the ice. And if you still want to go, that's going to open up a lot more trade possibilities. And Holland has already said he will do what he can to move them. But I still think his best bet is to play here. He's already put in some time here. The team is pretty much pop committed like I don't see the point in the team getting rid of him 
unless of course he's the one forcing the issue uh it sucks this is not where we should be with him this is the second top end prospect in less than a decade we've done this with you would have liked to think we would have learned the first time obviously it's not the exact same thing but it is what it is i i still think that this is still salvageable Knowing him, I think if Holland and Tippett were to fly out, say, Sunday after the draft is over, go out to Finland, spend a couple days with them, show them the love, show them that they want him here, show them that he's going to be playing here and he's going to get the opportunity that he'd be more than happy and he'll be back here in September 100% ready to go and he can have the start to this, his year that he kind of had last year because last year... Up until, I don't know, say game 8, 9, 10, somewhere in there, he was looking good. We had a game in Winnipeg last year in game 4 or 5. He was the best player on the ice. That is the kid I expect. That is the player I know can be uh, is inside of him still. And that is the guy that I think should just still be wearing 98 in our silks. Like it's it, Just go out there, make him feel better, better about it, and let's get over this. Yesterday, Ken Holland chimed in on it where he said, I'm not giving a player away just because they're unhappy. No way. If I trade a player, then I have to get fair value or I'm not doing it. I'm not trading a player just to get him out of my hair. Cameron, what do you think about the Pooley Arvey situation? Uh, it reminds me a lot of the Jonathan Duran situation in Tampa Bay a few years ago. Jonathan Duran was selected by the Lightning third overall, I think, in 2013 after him and Nathan McKinnon made an absolute mockery of the QMJHL. Dan can probably speak to that because... I don't know if anybody's ever, if he's ever mentioned it, but Dan uh, lived in Halifax, so he had a front row seat. Did he live in Halifax? Dan lived in Halifax. I was a season ticket holder. The Halifax Mooseheads. Halifax Mooseheads. But those, yeah, so Duran got picked third overall. He went back to junior for one season, dominated, scored two points per game, and then he came up in his uh, draft plus two year, didn't do very well. He only scored four goals over the course of the year. And then the following year after that, he was continuing to struggle. Steve Eiserman, GM at Tampa, uh, Tampa Bay at the time, had to set him down. He didn't like it, and then through his agent, Alan Walsh, Drew Ann demanded a trade, refused to report to the AHL team, trade deadline came and went, Eiserman didn't pull the trigger, Drew Ann went to the AHL team, started playing well, came up, was pretty good for the Lightning down the stretch, had a good year the following year, and then finally got his wish a year and a half after his trade demand, and he got traded to his hometown, Montreal Canadiens, Tampa Bay got Mikhail Sergachev, everybody wins. You gotta be patient. I, I agree you have to be patient and I kind of wish that the whole going to Europe thing was even on the table. I know some people are bringing up that, oh, well, he can go to Europe and light up whatever league he happens to play in there, whether it's the KHL or not, which isn't a guarantee. Like, that's still a professional hockey league. There's no guarantee he's going to go there and completely light it up. And my concern with that would be if he disappears from the public eye, that little bit of hype maybe that other organizations might feel about him, that little bit of potential might be like, well, now we're trading for a guy who hasn't even played in the NHL in the last 12 years or in the last 12 months um the example i brought up in my piece that i wrote a couple of weeks or about a week ago was nino niederreiter when he was first dealt from the islanders to the wild for cal clutterbuck cal clutterbuck in a third round pick at that time niederreiter had played 64 nhl games he had two goals and one assist <laughs> like he literally was doing nothing that's an amazing stat line like there's not like yes at least has some glimmers of offensive potential that teams can look at and the Oilers can point to. Niederreiter had absolutely none of that. He brought back Clutterbuck, who at the time was 25 years old, could score you 10 to 15 goals a season and a third round pick. So to me, if someone like Niederreiter could get you a reliable third liner and a third round pick, then I, to me, like Puglia Yarvi should still be able to get you something. And I'm also kind of a fan of maybe you throw him into a deal to just kind of up the value a little bit. Like if you're looking at something where you want to trade Matt Benning to free up a spot for a younger guy in the AHL to play next year. Maybe you see if Benning and Puglia Yarvi can get you a middle six winger that can score you 15 to 20 goals. I, I still think there's some value there. And just looking back at some past trades with some of these struggling prospects, I, to sit there and go, Puglia Yarvi has no value right now, I, I think that's inaccurate. Well, the last time we saw a former fourth overall pick get traded, three years after his draft year, was one, Griffin Reinhardt. And he was worth the 16th and 33rd overall pick. So there's no reason the Oilers can't get a first and second round pick in this year's draft tomorrow. And he had like eight NHL games at that point. Yeah, he was very clearly a bust playing for the Bridgeport Sound Tigers, logging six minutes a night, 
But Pizzarelli now slamming works a cold the, one on the bench between periods and. <laughs> but Pizzarelli now works for the St. Louis Blues, so Stanley Cup champion that, Peter Pizzarelli uh, is going to be on the Stanley Cup for the Blues the, again this year. Yeah. He just hangs around there. Does he actually work for them? I don't know. I what just he does is he uh, Doug Armstrong is like um, Pete. What 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 move would you make? And Pete's like, Oh yeah, I would do this. And then Doug Armstrong does the exact opposite. That wouldn't be bad. That's what you could do. I mean, you like, could do. Listen to his advice and do the opposite. It makes sense. I like it. One question I want to ask you guys back on Puliarvi is, to me, I don't think his agent is helping him at all, speaking to the media as often he is, hammering how much Jesse wants to trade, hammering that he's not going to play in Edmonton. Wouldn't it make... I know, I know the agent works for the player. I know that. So if Jesse's telling him to do it, and I, I don't know, I'm just speculating. I'm throwing shit on the wall. Jesse's telling him to do it and he's doing what he's told because he's his agent. I get that. But isn't it his duty to say to him, listen, man, we'll get you traded, but go into Edmonton, earn a spot, grind away 40 games, and then let's talk about it again around Christmas. Wouldn't that make way more sense from actually trying to get what he wants than the Oilers? Like Ken Holland has said, I'm not going to rush into trading him. So are they going to Sheldon Surrey him into the, into Europe for a year just because he's got no value and Ken Holland's like willing to wait it out? I don't know. Dan, what do you think about the agent thing? Well, yeah. So so like Rick Rick spoke to the fact that this kid has been let down by a lot of grown adults, and I think you just have to add in his agent as one of those as one of those that are part of the issue. Hey, yeah, man, Tyler's dying right now. Yes, you're... we're gonna take a moment to say Tyler's dying. He could be leaning over in the corner. Back in his seat. R.I.P. Didn't even miss a shift. Okay, All right. hockey player. Hockey player didn't miss a shift. A professional broadcaster doesn't cough around microphones. You walk away and do your coughing. You know, I thought maybe you guys would be able taking to taking shots that. at me from three weeks ago. <laughs> Jeez. Um, no, yeah. So I, I think that for a uh, for a kid, you're right, Bag Milk. He probably Jesse probably told his agent that he wants to get out, but also his agent could be like. You know what, Jesse? Like, I get it. I understand. And you massage that, but maybe there's work a better that into way exactly. to do it. And 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 this this whole like, when has a public trade request ever worked out for a player? Like, it just it just doesn't seem like it's that that smart of an idea anymore. And I don't understand the the option of doing it now. Eli Manning. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, yeah, but that was when he was yeah. drafted. Maybe. John Elway. But that's, Eli yeah. Manning said before he was drafted he wasn't going to play for the San Diego Chargers. And, and like, drafted him anyway. And most people looking at the Jesse Pugliarvi situation now are like, yeah, I get it. You're upset with the team. You're upset with how you've been handled. But doing this all publicly does nothing to help the Oilers, does nothing to help Jesse. It's just a lose-lose all around. Yeah, I don't get how it got public either. Uh, I could see the agent, even if that's what – sit down. If that's what, you, that's what you want to do, no problem. Tell you what, these are our options here. Let's go about it this way. Uh, his agent has a lot of big names already under him. So he's gone through these things before. It's not like a rookie agent. So sit there, lead him, show him the proper way to get what he eventually wants. And I don't, I agree with you guys. I just, I don't see how going public, I don't see how threatening to play in a different country helps anything at all. Well, and I mean, like, I've been a Pugliarvi supporter since the day he was drafted. I remember going bananas when he slid to the Oilers at four. And, like, I still believe the kid can contribute, but... He's still a kid. He just turned 21, like, a month and a half ago. But there's also the angle, like, man, you you got to help yourself here as well. I agree. I mean, no, the Oilers have not handled him properly. That is... I would... I'll say that until the day he retires. However, I don't know how much he's also helping himself. Because I did get I did get a, a interesting DM from someone who used to work at the Oilers yesterday, and I was told they did get him an English tutor, and they did try really hard to help get him into the into the new culture. And it, I was just told it's really tough with 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 young guys like that. You got to put the work in. I mean, when we interviewed Laddie Schmid on the Real Life podcast, Tyler and I were sitting in on that. And he was talking about the importance of learning English so that he could fit in, so that he could talk to his teammates and go out for dinners and all the things that you have to do in a team sport. And he took it upon himself to really focus on making that happen. And if the Weathers um, did, in fact, get him a tutor and he wasn't really wanting to do it, well, then he needs to own some of that as well. See, and that's my fear is that uh, this is coming more out of the dressing room than anything else. Like, yeah, he's frustrated, yeah, all that other stuff. But 
if you were that frustrated, but those are your boys in the room, you go back and see your boys. I have this sneaking suspicion that he just doesn't fit in very well in the room. And I thought it was because uh, I thought it was the language barrier. And maybe it is even more now. If the other guys are going around that you're not trying very hard. Like I, I am 100% on his side, but I have to look at it objectionally and say there's two sides to every story. And yeah. this can't be 100% on one party here. So there has to be something out there. And I know when he's comfortable, he speaks better. It's sure. not perfect, but he speaks better. Yeah. Uh, when he's not comfortable, he's very quiet. I think- very quiet. And, and he'll definitely lose out a lot of words. And when there's a camera on, he gets almost shy and he just starts like picking out words from the English dictionary. He starts eating pizza. I think the the important Loves thing, pizza. and I think like a lot of other fans do love Jesse Puliarvi and myself. I'm I'm part of that major part of that fan club. Uh, but at the end of the day, I think Bag Milk kind of summed it up perfectly. Ken Holland is not Peter Shirelli, and he won't have he won't and, have that guy. And Tippett's and Dave Tippett isn't Todd McClellan. Oh yeah, we know no, we sure. watched Todd. It's got McClellan. a little soft touch. What Don't was one of the one of the best nice. things about Detroit was Real they nice. never brought kids up very early, right? So when he was working with Babcock in Detroit, he would have had a lot of older players. Now move him over to San Jose. How many times did he have younger players uh, pulling big minutes on his team? He didn't have to look at all the all the leaders there, and even if they were, those leaders were grabbing young kids and showing them the way. You look at a guy like Joe Thornton, you know Joe Thornton. Grabs you when you're a rookie and kind of shows you the way, whether it be the nice way or grab you by the scruff of the neck. We don't have that in Edmonton. Yeah. Luch ain't that guy. Well, yeah, you just look at like a Toronto right now with Marlowe and all the media attention. Those guys are worth something. Young guys around. Those yeah. guys are worth something. That dynamic in the dressing room is huge in this sport. And if you don't feel like you're one of the boys, if you don't fit in, it's going to take a toll on you. And if you don't have a proper family life outside of that to kind of make up for it, well, guess what? You're going to sit at home and just think about how bad things are and how much you'd rather be somewhere else. Well, Real you- quick around the horn, uh, just want to wrap up on the Pooley Arby thing. Dan, do you think he's going to be here come September? If not, when do you think he's going to move? Let's go real quick around the horn. I think he's here in September, and I, 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 don't, I don't think he... Yeah, I think he's here until September, and a trade would happen next season, next off season. Rick, I think he's here in September. I think he plays the season here, and I think things get smoothed out. Yes, I'm Mister Optimism. I I think he's gone by Monday. I don't think he's an Oiler by the end of the draft. I think this has reached a point where you need to cut bait with him. Um, I think they'll get something for him at the draft. I think there will be enough teams desperate to hey, you know what, that guy will bring him back on a one million dollar contract next year. He's got to be a qualified, chance. right? So he's got to be qualified. Yeah, so it's probably just over a mil or something. Like that. Yeah, it's yeah, just fair. over a mil. So I think there's enough teams that'll look at him and go, "That's a gamble we're willing to take on a fourth, former fourth overall pick." Um, bring him into a structured organization. Sure, Oilers, you want a 15 goal third line winger? There you go. And I think he's gone this weekend. Yeah, I think he's gone in the offseason too. Um, I, I, I said I think they should be patient, but. I think there's a lot of pressure with the Oilers right now to push and make the playoffs next year, and I think he does have enough value right now where they can still get something back that's solid. I hope they don't do Jesse Pugliari for Cal Clutterbuck 2.0, but, I mean, I, I just think he'll be part of another package. Maybe they move up at the draft. I don't know. Something something pre-free agency probably happens. I also think he's going to be traded this summer uh, for what it's worth. I don't like it. Um, I think there are mistakes made on both sides. Um the team has to own a lot of it. I think Jesse has to own some of it as well. And it sucks. It sucks that we're doing this again with another top prospect from Europe just that just doesn't seem to have the support network here to fit in and feel comfortable and do all the things that you need to be uh, to have a successful professional career. I want to go ahead and mention our friends at Sherwood Ford the Giant again. Dan, we are talking earlier about racing for a cure. Go and check them out on Twitter at Sherwood Ford on Twitter and on Instagram at Sherwood Ford underscore the giant. They've got all the links they need there on our social media at Oiler Nation Alt. We're going to be changing that, by the way. Uh, we're coming up with some different ideas and what we can do with it. That handle was always supposed to be temporary. Um, we are going to change it at some point. But for now, it's at Oilers Nation Alt. Come support our team. 
donate a little to the nation. We're raising some money for the Stollery. It's good news. Dan, give us the details. Yep. So once again, uh, this Saturday, uh, starting at 7 a.m. out in St. Albert, they're going to be giving some kids some helicopter rides around the city. It will be pretty cool. And then uh, it's going to continue on from 11 a.m. to noon in Edmonton, uh, where the, the parade will be uh, going through the cityscape. Uh, kids will be traveling around in, in the nation truck, uh, another, another VIP vehicle. Uh, just a really exciting kind of uh, make-a-wish kind of day for a lot of kids. And, uh, you know, it's a really cool experience for us to be a part of. And as you said, Bag Milk, it's, it's nothing without the nation that, that donates their, uh, their money and time to help us out with that too. Of course, we're recording today is Thursday because we wanted to give uh, a proper draft preview. Um, one of my favorite times of the year is draft week and just like all the nonsense that leads up to the draft, all the rumors, all the questions about who's going to go where. I remember last year, there was a lot of rumors about Colton Pareko um, as a trade option for the Oilers. Fast forward a year, he's now Stanley Cup champion. Interesting how these kind of this kind of news leaks out or comes out or whatever you want to call it as we go into the draft. Draft weekend has kind of turned into like the big movement time in the NHL. And it's always super interesting. So I just want to touch on some of the rumors are out there. Tyler's going to have an article up probably by the time you hear this. Uh, it's going up at 2 p.m. Mountain. He looks at some of the stuff that's going on right now as it pertains to the Oilers just around the league. It's one of the things that he's talking about is perhaps the Canucks wanting to move up in the draft to get a guy like Philip Broberg, who has been linked to the Oilers all week. Yeah, honestly, if, if the Canucks want to move up from 10 to 8, and I'm the Oilers, I'm listening to that all day. Like, I personally, I'm not sold on Broberg. I've heard enough maybe sketchy things about him as a prospect, and enough of the lists that I trust have him far down, like Simon Boisvert, who uh, we talk, I talk to at TSN quite a bit. He's a former QMJHL scout. Um, he has him all the way down at 26. Like, and the Oilers don't need another defenseman. And no, and they're so Especially not a lefty demon. And I know you never draft per, for position, and you take the best player available. But Broberg coming into your system just feels like a bit of a waste. So if the Canucks really want someone at eight, and you're the Oilers, and you go, you know what? There's going to be a good forward still available at ten that we like. Why not see what they're willing to offer? At Do ten, we- you're you're going to be able to get like. Cole Caulfield, probably like maybe like a Peyton Krebs, maybe a Matthew Boldy. Do we I would f- easily do that. Do yeah. we give the Oilers enough credit to think that maybe they're floating out the Broberg name with their media types to try and get the, the FOMO stronger from Vancouver? Well, I think the fact that it's really trusted guys putting it out, like it's the Rashogs and Stoffers. It's not just like random people on Twitter. Um, those guys usually have sources that are pretty rock solid and they trust like – if I'm a Ryan Rashog and a source says, oh, we're, we're taking Broberg, you know, eh? and then it, you find out that it was just a farce and that source used you, like you're going to be pretty ticked off. Yeah. I, I think these guys have enough trusted people in the organization that if it's getting out there, it's getting out there for a reason. Um, but the fact that Jason Greger goes against it and says he doesn't think it's going to happen mean leads me to believe that maybe there's a bit of a split in the organization on what they should do. But um, if the Canucks come offering with number 10 for 8, I think you look at it. I'm just not exactly sure what that deal would look like. We know the Canucks are looking at maybe trying to get rid of someone like Chris Tanev, who has one more year at $4.5 million. He's a right shot D-man. Um, maybe a part of a bigger deal where you're throwing in pieces like Tanev and Russell because the Canucks do need lefties pretty bad. It's also but like your Lucic Erickson sweetener right there. It could be your Lucic Erickson sweetener. Vancouver really wants a sweetener as well. So I think there's a lot of options. I think these two teams might actually be a bit of a fit or if Lucic and eight for Erickson and 10 isn't very good value wise. What about something like there would have to be more in this, but the Canucks have Brandon Sutter. Who's kind of overpaid. What about something around Lucic and eight for Brandon Sutter and 10? What's his contract? 4.8 mil for two more years. They really like Sutter though. Don't they? I thought they did. He's kind of fallen out of oh, is he okay? like I jump on that right now. I, I would too. I mean, you have, you'd have to throw in more if you're the Oilers. But if the Canucks are willing to shake things up and they do want to get, quote unquote, bigger and stronger and meaner, like Jim Benning has said, I mean. But if they want to get bigger, stronger, and meaner, they're not going to get rid of Brandon Sutter, who's like your stack. You're going to bring in Luch, though. Yeah, exactly. And that's why you get rid of Erickson, who's, you yeah. know, your. Yeah, but your I think the Oilers Luch. really want him back. I think I Sutter in 10 for Luch 8 and your choice of Bear, Lagesson, or Pearson. 
probably would probably be there in that scenario. But that's I don't fine. know. That's I, yeah. That's up to that's up. Like to, who do the Canucks have down the middle apart from aside from him? Right? Well, they have Pedersen, Horvat, Horvat and Pedersen's your one-two punch. Horvat, Pedersen, Jay Beagle. So I mean, Jay Beagle's an ugly, ugly contract. But <laughs> still, if they're looking to shave off some money. It's a lot of bad contracts in Vancouver. Vancouver has a lot of bad deals. And, and they the fact can't that really Jim, be worried about shaving money if they're trying to move up in the draft at the same time. You can't really try and do both things in the but same deal. But if they're deal. taking Lucic, they probably yeah. want to Yeah, and that's and back. that's and that's where I'm sitting there going, "Well, we'll get we'll get the Sutter contract off your hands." You know, now now you've only got 2 million to deal with. Go ahead, figure your shit out. But we'll take Sutter in 10. You can have mm-hmm. 8. That's a Luch. really easy contract to stomach the Sutter one because I imagine given when it was signed, it's not buyout proof. No, and or maybe it's something like you know, Lucic Bear eight, and the Oilers hold on to a one point two of Lucic for yeah, Sutter and ten. Where like, okay, it. we'll keep a little bit of Call. Luch for you, Send and then in. Sutter's deal is done Where's a little the fax quicker. Machine? Send it in. <laughs> Send it in. Man. It's done. I'll call Jim right now. Right now, <laughs> Gary, bag of milk. Get Gary on the phone. I also want to uh, talk about uh, Broberg a little bit more. Uh, because Tyler did mention Gregor's quote from it yesterday. So what Gregor said is, I will be shocked if the Oilers select Broberg. Many stories get legs during draft week, but after discussion with scouts and other sources, I'm led to believe this one will not come to fruition. So that's Gregor. Hopefully he's right. Also from Dusty's article this morning, Guy Flaming uh, talked to a scout where Dusty told him, or sorry, where Flaming was telling the scout about the rumors growing in Edmonton about Broberg and this scout's response was that would be the most Oilers pick ever at number eight friend of the nation Ufe Bowden from elite prospects also chimed in on this with a little scouting report saying that would be a high risk high reward pick for the Oilers he's got great physical tools but seems to lack in hockey IQ if he gets everything together he could be a superstar or he could be a third pairing D-man the IQ thing scares me if there's one thing you can learn longer into your career it's hockey IQ yeah, that, that terrifies me. It seems well, like you're drafting like, Darnell Nurse all over again. Well, and I mean, and it took a long fucking time for that guy to like. Yeah, because he had to keep sw- he had to keep trying to keep afloat another defenseman partner. If they gave him a proper veteran to learn under, he'd be fine. He'd be so much further ahead than, than where he is right now. Well, we'll see what happens. Uh, personally, I think well, and Ken Holland also to add another wrinkle into this had a little in- uh, interview go up on NHL.com today. And to paraphrase, he says we've got a lot of defensive prospects. Kind of need some forwards. So you need goal scorers. Cole Caulfield. Cole Caulfield's the guy. Or if you're going to move back, uh, I was reading the McKenzie the McKenzie article, and he said the second best natural goal, goal scorer was uh, Arthur Kaliev out of uh, Hamilton. This kid is what? He's 6'2", 194, and he's just a natural goal scorer. He's, he's a left-handed shot. And we need goal scorers. I'm sorry. Like at the end of the day, we've got three guys to get past the puck. We have enough defensemen to get by. We have a little bit. Of, we have got enough grit down there to play your your third and fourth line. We need someone who can score goals. Go get someone who can score goals. Another thing Tyler mentioned was a couple of uh, notes from Ryan Rashog. He had a tweet up yesterday morning where he's talking about Broberg again. Pooley RV said if they can land a third line forward for it, I think they do it. Otherwise, they'll stand. Pat, he also says Matt Benning is in play. Could be a move to create some space for a young defenseman. And as a UFA target, he mentioned Brett Connolly uh, could be an option for the Oilers as well. So I'm curious what you guys think about the idea of moving Matt Benning. I like Matt Benning. I think he often has to fight above his weight class. Um, more often than not, I would say. I like the way he hits. He's, he's scrappy. He's willing to mix it up. He's got a nice shot. He can move the puck a little bit. Um, not the worst option that they have on the right side. What do you guys think about moving Matt Benning? I I said before the podcast that he's my pick to move this weekend. Um, I I like Matt Benning, and I think when he when he plays with confidence, he's noticeably better than when not. In 2017, he was he was a really you know just strong and, and confident guy, and then it went away. But uh, he had I a just, bad start to last year. But he had yeah. a good he had a good finish. Oh yeah, fair enough. But but I just. Uh, I think that there's some. I think that there's some value there, and there's enough enough uh, tangible evidence for another team to look at him and, and actually see some value. For him. I think moving at Benning just creates another another hole that you still have. You still who's going to play Caleb Benning's Jones? Minutes? Caleb Jones is a lefty, though. Yeah, you fill it with uh, Darnell Nurse. See now, if you're going to move Benning, I think you move Benning at like Christmas time. Give another right handed shot half the year in the AHL. Maybe sprinkle him up some games in the AHL. See what he what he can do. 
uh, in the big league. But I don't think you pull that trigger right now unless you do have some sort of backup plan. I, I like what he can do, and I was really hard on Matt Benning for the first bit of last year. But as soon as he started playing with Andre Sekera towards the end there, his game really calmed down to me. I haven't looked into the numbers or anything oh, like that, but I noticed that when Sekera was there and he had that veteran to rely on, that was a really good third pairing. So as much as I kind of like the idea of like a Benning for Brown swap, the fact that Matt Benning is a righty who can play at the NHL level makes me a little bit more hesitant to move on from him. Like You need righties. Their only actual righty, well, they have Benning, and then they have Larson. And who else do they have that can play the right side right now? Nobody knows if Bouchard, Bouchard's ready, and Bear might be, but um, like again, I'm... If you trade Benning and don't replace him on the right side, Here's you're going to go into next year with... Chris Russell is your number two righty. And playing on his off side, some right? Some rookie playing. Which is why I mentioned the Russell for Tanev idea, just because you could get a natural righty in here for him. But um, to me, you got to be careful trading Matt Benning. But if you think you have a replacement for him, or if there's another trade out there, then I th- I'd be more open to it. Yeah, teams are like tripping over themselves to acquire like decent righty defensemen, and it's like yeah. a big struggle for everyone to do it. And the Oilers seem to have one here who's cheap, and they're in like this desperate urge to get rid of him. I don't know what that's all about. I think betting's fine. I mean, if Bouchard and Bear are so good in the AHL next year and they're pushing their way up, then sure, like move them, like Rick said, in January yeah. and get a winger when. You know, there's a team that's more desperate to acquire that player and you can get more in return. But let's not make those kids start off in the NHL, start no. behind the eight ball, start in a situation start where Start them like, in the AHL and earn their way up. We need to win. We need to make the playoffs. Every single mistake they get is magnified. Yeah. We don't need to do that to anybody else. Let's keep our defense the way it is. Let's move Russell out. Let Sekra play. I still move Nurse over to the right side for half the year. You still you can move Jones in. Benning Another year, going to be able to play a little bit more. His weight class is going to move up a little bit. We need forwards. We need goal scoring. Let's concentrate there. Our defense is fine. But then if you're sacrificing from the defense, that's kind of where the issue comes. Yeah, yeah. That, yeah. If, 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 that, if that's the case, if we're going to start moving out assets on the D for mm-hmm. forwards, then yeah, I'm definitely down with that. But if you're looking at moving a lefty for a righty or righty for a lefty, I just... I think, man, we need we need to score goals. See, and to me, like, if you trade Benning for Brown, let's just say that happens because it's been rumored for so long. Mm-hmm. So you deal off, you make that swap, and then on your left side, you okay, you find another veteran righty, and a team needs a lefty, so you swap Russell and a pick for a good righty. And then if next year, if your D pairings are Clefbaum Larson, obviously, mm-hmm. and then you'd have Nurse playing with whoever the righty is you acquire mm-hmm. in the Russell deal, and if your third pairing is Sekera, and then Maybe it is Bouchard, probably is Bouchard, or you put Secker on his offside and put Jones up there. Yeah. To me, that that's not the worst thing in the world. Nope. Yeah, that's you certainly aren't improving your defense, but I don't think it, you're making it like substantially worse. No, and again, you're just starting the season that way. No one says you have to play that way the whole year. You can continually make moves as throughout the year, and and but I think we have the we have the framework for a good D. We've got a couple extra assets there we can put up front. And we need to, Colin needs to go out and, <laughs> I hate this analogy, but he needs to go win a, a Chirelli Maroon trade. Or, you know, it'd be really nice to, uh, it'd be a breath of fresh air, kind of like what you would get from our friends at Pog, that if they could maybe win a one-for-one. One. Wouldn't it be nice to be on the reverse side of a one-for-one one where oh, you're like, sweet. holy hell, how did that happen? As I mentioned, though, that would be a breath of fresh air, like you'll get from our friends at Pog. So what you need to do is you need to head to thepogstore.com, check out a unit that fits your lifestyle, whether that's the plug-in wall unit, a portable one, or something in your fridge. Jim Bank stinks, they got something for you. House stinks in general, they got something for you. Fridge smell like death, no problem. We've got a fridge unit for you. Head on over to thepogstore.com, pick one up, kill 98% of household orders caused by bacteria and fungus, freshen and purify the air naturally using the power of ozone and eliminate odors without the use of dangerous chemicals. Head on over to thepogstore.com and get involved in their 30-day odor-free challenge. You know you want to. You know you want to. Wrapping up on the draft talk really quickly, I just kind of want to get your guess on what you think is going to happen. Personally, I think this is just me guessing. I think Holland's going to move down, not beyond 11-12. I don't think he'll move past that going down. 
but I think he's going to make two trades on the weekend. One will be a Chris Russell. I said on Real Life on Monday, I think Chris Russell is going to be the one that gets moved. Ooh, that would be good. Just as a salary cap dump, uh, don't if you're listening to this, don't take this as me shitting on Chris Russell. That's not it. They need cap space, and somebody has to go. He's a valuable player in some other markets. Sure. Everybody needs a cowboy, man. Dude Ranch is for everybody. That's my guess. Dan, what is your guess? I think the Canucks move up, trade with, make a trade with Detroit, and Zegras falls to us. That's my that'll be my prediction. I don't know. I like I said, I think Benning goes in the weekend. I don't know what the deal would be though. So whether it's a Toronto or not. I could see us moving back a spot or two, but I don't see us moving back too far. Uh, it's going to be a forward, someone who could score some goals. Uh, my preference, obviously, is Cole Caulfield. Really, at the end of the day, just get me someone who can score goals. That's all I care. Yeah, I'm of the same mind. I don't think the Oilers do any major trades at the draft. I think they stand still, draft eighth overall. They draft a Cole Caulfield, a Trevor Zigris, one of those guys, a forward. Probably jump in and help the team sooner rather than later, which I mean, eh. but, you know, that just kind of makes sense. I don't think we see a big trade until like around free agency time. I think the dominoes will fall once the Oilers can figure out how to do their Lucic move, which I think will have to happen after July 1. I think we'll see three things. They'll take a forward at eight. I think the Canucks are itching to make a big splash in front of their home crowd. So I could see them moving up and maybe even just swapping picks with the Detroit Red Wings. That seems like Eiserman might do. He's obviously he's a smart guy and I could see him just sliding back, grabbing an asset and still getting a good forward. Um, for the Oilers, I think they'll take a forward at eight. I think Chris Russell and Yessa Puglia Yarvi will be out of the organization. So that's kind of my so prediction. Frank Cooper's for not going to bring in the hometown boy, Mr. Lucic. Not this weekend. Uh, I think part not until of, July 1st. If the Oilers can talk Vancouver out of like a legit tangible sweetener, I think part of it might be we'll pay his bonus and then give him to you. Yeah, that's fair. I'm down. So that'll be after July the 1st. After July the 1st. And the other thing, too, with trading Chris Russell. Uh, he still has a full no trade right now, and it doesn't expand until the new season starts on July 1st. July 1st, right? I mean, the, the way around that is to say, Chris, we're going to try to trade you in July. Just give us the list now. Who would you go to? Yeah. And try to facilitate it a little bit earlier and just tell him that, hey, we're going to try to trade you if you want to go to one of your destinations. It's easier if we do it at the draft. So it's not that big of a hurdle, but I do agree with Cam. Maybe it will wait until July. But my official prediction is draft a forward, <laughs> trade JP, and trade Chris Russell. Oh. Bum, 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 bum. Man, I, I like I know the draft is in Vancouver, but I kind of forgot that it was in Vancouver. Man, it'd be sweet if they could get Lucic there. And all off season, Milan's the, been talking all sorts of nice things. He's about been Vancouver. saying all kinds of nice things. Maybe D Cats just slides him over a thumb drive with a few bitcoins on it and say, "You don't worry about that bonus. I got that bonus money right, for yeah, you." No, you're fine. Man, that'd be great. The crowd would go bananas. Then they'll Google his stats. You think the Canucks fans would go <laughs> excited about that? <laughs> yeah, I think you they think, would. You think Gary Bettman comes Bangalore. out and we have a trade to announce. The Vancouver Canucks have acquired Milan Lucic and Nathan Oviedo. They would get excited. I bet yep. they would. Instantaneous, but then, yeah. I think they would. That's and then they'll Google me. how the last three I think it would be more like... <sighs> <laughs> and like That would be like the sound of the stadium <laughs> audible. Because it would also include the other side of the things that are going that. out of their town, which if it includes Erickson, I think they'd be happy. Yeah, it, Cam's been doing that heavy breathing thing yeah. like this whole time. <gasps> trying to just trying to go through it, you know, just trying to work through the uh, changing the gears a little bit. The Oilers started rounding out their coaching staff. It was announced, well, kind of broke last night. Officially announced today, Jim Playfair is coming to resume his post as an associate under Dave Tippett. He was last an associate coach with the Arizona Coyotes in 2016-17. You'll also remember Jim Playfair from that time that he stripped on the bench and started chucking shit on the ice. That's Great. my personal favorite. And I also like the idea that if there's any place in the NHL that could probably get him angry enough to do it again, it's right here with us. So I'm looking forward to that, Jim Playfair. Dusty said yesterday it seems like the Mark Lamb thing is going to happen sooner than later. Thoughts on Jim Playfair coming in as an associate? Do you care? What are you thinking of the coaching staff overall so far? We've got Tippett, Gullitson, and Playfair, soon to be Mark Lamb probably. What do you guys think so far? we got so much Flames content there. And so many angry people. you got Gullitson tossing sticks in the stands. you got Playfair tossing his shirt off the bench and a bench. Yeah, we're, 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 we're throwing stuff in practice. We're throwing stuff during the game. we got it all covered. Hey, welcome to Edmonton, Jim. Get the work. 
Hopefully he's better at assistant coaching the Oilers than he was at playing for the Oilers, which he never did despite being drafted. 20th overall in 1982. Played, played for two games for the Oilers? He played two games. Two. Oh, I did a post about it yesterday and said so he never played for the Oilers. So. Goom doesn't know anything. Um, I'm done caring about the assistant coaches that they hire. Yeah. It like it's it seems like every summer for the past like five years it's like oh they brought this guy's gonna fix the PK that's what, Man, and then Manny like, V knows how to talk to the kids yeah and then it's just evidently not yeah you get to Bully December Arby. and you realize that it's all irrelevant mm-hmm. so I think I'm kind of done with the assistant coach hype welcome to the city get to work Tyler Remchuk quoted as saying NHL coaches don't matter <laughs> <laughs> fucking if you, if you have a problem with that make sure to follow Tyler on Twitter and yell at him for it he's got wonderful takes. All right, well, then let's change gears then, Tyler. <laughs> Fine. Be that way. Yeah, we'll talk about your fucking beer league team, man. Whatever. No, what I want to talk about, actually, is I want to talk about why the Philadelphia Flyers thought it would be a good idea to sign Kevin Hayes to a mammoth contract. Monster contract. I don't understand it. I don't get it. He had 19 goals last year. That doesn't seem like a guy who should have seven point whatever he got. I'm going to look at Puckpedia right now to get the exact number. Do you think that we're in a collision course for some kind of like something to happen to reel back these contracts again? Because it seems like these GMs aren't learning from their own mistakes. It seemed like they were for a bit, though. If you look back at the year that we signed Luch, nobody really else threw any ridiculous money around with with term to that type of player. That, that was a bad year, actually, because there was yeah, Andrew was Ladd, bad. there was Ocposo, and there was... Friends, uh, Nielsen, but David coming on, Bacchus, come, coming, on after, coming on after that, though? There was two yeah, years where no one... Coming on after shit. that, it was almost like everybody kind of smartened up a bit. So Kevin Hayes got seven point one four two million dollars over seven years for fifty million bones. That's eight point seven three percent of their of Philly's cap space, courtesy of our friends at Puckpedia.com. Like, wow, what is going on? Well, and it's like I I asked Coom Coom just rattled off all of the information. Coom does know some things. Coom, what did he? What did? Uh, what was the trade with Winnipeg? The two trades that happened with him. So Winnipeg acquired Hayes at the, at the deadline. They gave their first round pick and Brendan Lemieux, like a decent little depth prospect player with years of control. And then they got rid of Jacob Truba and they got back that same first round pick and Neil Poink. So what, or Pionk? I don't know. So what Winnipeg like Poink did. Better. Poink. Poink. So Poink. <laughs> Winnipeg Poink. gave away Jacob Truba and Brendan Lemieux for like, 22 games of uh, Hayes. Yeah, and got nothing from him in the playoffs. He, like, he had like one game. He's got where five he goals was, yeah. down the stretch. They lost so. in the first round. They still don't have an airport. Yeah, it's just a it's a weird it's a weird transaction all around. It's like the Flyers do this every two or three years though. They just they throw a they throw a wild card in there. They, they, signed, they signed JVR last year too. Van Riemsdyk for seven yeah. million years. So they're yeah. throwing fourteen million plus dollars at. Kevin Hayes and JVR, like, good lord. It makes no sense. Like, you're looking at other guys out there that are going to get a $2 million raise just because this guy, uh, what, what they did to the... Meanwhile, the, you can sign Corey Perry for, like, two years, $3 million. No, no. Let's sign him for... I'll give Perry one year. Two years, $3 million. Do you do it? $3 million per year. No. Yeah. Like, if, one I, mil... One year. I mean, why he scored? He scored five goals last year. We're getting off track. He pays six million dollars a year for five goals of Lucic. If, if we're talking serious about Perry, I would do two years, and the AAV needs to start with two, and then I two point nine. Yeah, I'm down. Two point nine nine. Yeah, like, honestly, like two point nine 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 nine. Um, but back to Kevin Hayes. If there was one team that can afford to pay Kevin Hayes all that money, it's the Flyers. Even after that signing. They still have $21.9 million in cap space. Well, there's How many players of mediocre left to players they can go sign. Um, to sign, they need Travis Konechny, who's a big one. But still, that's what, even if they go long-term with him, that's $5 million on a long-term deal for Travis Konechny. Yeah, I mean, if you're in the mood of paying mediocre players a lot of money, then why not give Travis Konechny um, And then on the back end, yet. Sanheim and Provorov. And same thing. Those, Those guys are, are probably $5 mil each. Good Lord. We're just on the just high end. $15 million to to ensure the Flyers don't make the playoffs for the next decade. Yeah, but those those that's kind of their young up and coming core, right? That if they a sad up and coming core. If they wanted to lock them in for seven years, Sanheim, Provorov, and uh, Konechny, that's kind how of how much are you paying Gritty? <laughs> um, but even after that, even if they get all their big RFAs done, they still have like they'll still have between six and ten million dollars in cap. Comes out space. that Gritty's counting like seven point five mil against the cap too. All right. <laughs> I like I like that your M Chuck is still like getting used to. He's the getting coom. hard. He just pulled the, the mic. Right. He's just going hard Wild on the Philadelphia artists. Flyers cap situation. I'm just having none of it. <laughs> He's not used to the the Coom uh, wildcard <laughs> throwouts there. 
Speaking of fresh contracts, let's discuss uh, Eric Carlson. He just signed a big ticket for 11.5 per eight years, $92 million. Hilarious. Now, I love Eric Carlson. Yeah, five years ago, ago, Eric Carlson. A while ago. He is now approaching 30 if he's not there already. He's 29. He just turned 29 at the end of May. Um, Monster deal. So the, the Sharks now have 26 plus million dollars locked up in three defensemen that are pushing 30 or over 30 already. Rick, I'll start with you since you're already chiming in. What do you think of this Carlson contract? Bad I was, idea? It's a horrible idea. I was against bring. I know like last year before he went over there, everyone's like, oh, you got to bring him here. Got to bring him in. Got him. Dude, he he's plateaued. His career is not getting any. He's not going to become any better of a player. He's plateaued and on the back end. It's not worth it. Like eight, I don't think I would have given him eight years. His his back end plateau is still so good though. Is like, it though? It, yeah, it is. He scored sixteen points in nineteen games in the playoffs this year. Eleven million dollars. That's worth? good. Like, Eleven million dollars. And in a world where in a world where you already have Burns. In a world where Tyler wants to pay fucking Travis Konechny five point <laughs> five million dollars a year. Well, I never sure. said point five. <laughs> <laughs> I but said it, the high end of a long term deal for him is probably five mil. Sandheim and Provorov are making ten mil combined. I happily throw all that money to Eric Carlson. I think the crazy part about it is that the Sharks are just like just as willing to sign Carlson as they were to say. See ya to Joel Pavelski, likely. No, I mean, uh, well, I mean the Flyers and their endless pursuit to be bad when they <laughs> took um, Justin Braun off of their books, no problem. So like, you know, you're you're you, if they get rid of Brendan Dillon too, you're freeing up a lot of room. How many injury? How many games injured did uh, Carlson have this year? He played fifty three games. He played fifty three games. Fifty. He didn't score a goal after he came back. He scored forty. He had forty five points in fifty three games. And what were his injuries? Uh, he had the groin injury and he also had foot injury. So both injuries but when he that was can playing for the team that he had the best the relative Corsi on the San Jose Sharks. I don't give a shit about that. <laughs> right Dude, ahead of too, the number it's two too on the much, team. It's too much money. What they they were kind of screwed though because he was a UFA. So it was either let him walk or you got to pay him. Do you think they'd be best suited trying to trade but for him? But their windows right now him? though, like. If yeah. you if you lose them and then you just kind of regress into being this mediocre team, like deal with your insane cap three years from now, and maybe you've won a Stanley Cup by then. Maybe maybe you're more likely to win a Stanley Cup in the next three years. But you're gonna you're gonna sacrifice Joe Pavelski probably. I don't know. Like how much money do they? At least have that's now? that's the rumor. I get think they of, could almost make it work if they get rid of Brendan Dillon. Yeah, you get rid of Brendan. Then Dillon. you're losing. Like look at all the all the secondary players you're gonna end up losing. Maybe a real top heavy ass team over here. Yeah, you really don't want to right. lose Joe Pavelski, but I mean, he scored thirty eight goals last year and led the team. Was it Gus has got to go? Gustav Nyquist. Oh, I think Nyquist is good as gone. Inevitably leaves as a free agent. Right now, they have fifteen million dollars, and they got to sign Timo. Sonora they got to sign Meyer, Kevin LeBanc, LeBanc, and Pavelski. And Joe Thornton wants to play for ten more years. So Thornton will come back for like one mil. He's got nothing else to do. So let's so, say if you find a way to shave out Brendan Dillon, you're sitting at like almost $19 million. Pavelski costs you 10. Meyer costs you 6. Pavelski costs you 10. Oh, okay. Hold on. Hold on. <laughs> you just oh said you scored 38 God. goals last year, man. How Kevin Hayes investment. just got, Kevin Hayes just got what? Pavelski will be, he'll be short term. Well, I mean, if, if, if Pavelski signs with the Flyers, I would expect $17 million <laughs> per season for Joe Pavelski. Okay. What, what's Pavelski making then? Eight, nine? Uh, I would guess 7.5. On a, how long of a deal? Three years. Three, you three think years. Pavelski on a three-year deal gets as much as Kevin Hayes, who's never cracked 50 points, man? Pavelski scored almost 40 goals last year. And he, That's about as many points as Kevin Hayes yeah, has. And Kevin he's been Hayes. with San Jose forever. Yeah, exactly. He's You can't shortchange a guy like that. He'll be closer to 10 than you think. Damn. Maybe. Yeah, maybe. So let's say, let's say he's nine, Meyer six, 15. You still have four mil. What happens if Carlson gets hurt next year again? What who's he, who's taking his spot? What if Carlson doesn't get hurt and he's healthy and he's as good as he was in the playoffs? That's a massive what if. When was the last time he played a whole year? Like last, like, what, 2016-17? Sounds? Seems like a long time. The thing that's I mean. wild, like this. That was the last time the Edmonton Oilers made the playoffs. Yeah, I know exactly what that was. <laughs> in in the 2024-2025 season, the Sharks are going to be paying a 34-year-old that's Eric incredible. Carlson, a 39-year-old Brent Burns, yeah. and a 37-year-old Mark Edward Vlasic, yeah. a combined $26.5 million. And you've got to have a 48-year-old yeah. Joe Thornton in there making three point <laughs> yeah. on a one-year deal. But those Western Conference championships are going to keep them warm at night. Oh. 
the Pacific Division banner. <laughs> yeah, here's the best part. You can spend all that money on the high end defenseman you want, man. Martin Jones might still let in a couple softies. Oh yeah, he's like Martin Jones is still Five fully capable of losing little. you a playoff series. Bag milk chant from the playoff Five run will forever live on. Okay, we also got to remember proudest moment of my life, people. We have a lockout coming up. No, we After don't. After next season. No, we don't. Everyone's going to get two compliance No, buyers. we don't. No, we don't. No, we don't. Pavelski's going to Minnesota. You heard it here first. I've I'm yet to hear so, I have yet to hear one person say they think there's going to be a uh, stop it. I'm you telling you that there's going to be I a lockout. Okay. Kevin Hayes. Hayes. Real not an insider. There. I can't hear him with a tinfoil on his head. <laughs> I know this is like, take this with a grain of salt, but John Shannon goes on stuff, whatever, every week, and he's said on numerous times, there will not. John Shannon also tweeted pitch. out yesterday information for um, <laughs> RFA offer sheets that were like six years old. He was like, uh, if you sign a guy to a $7 million contract, that's four first round picks. That's that was like information that's he's from spending all of his time worrying about the next stoppage. <laughs> the NHL. That there won't be. That was the NHL will have from a stoppage. back when the Oilers signed Thomas Vanek. The NHL will have a stoppage. The XFL will overtake it as the fourth best league in North America. And that's the end of the story. All, all right, boys, let's clear the air here. Just like what you ex- can expect from our friends at Puck, right? Can I tell you a little something about your transitions? Go ahead. Uh, right after we did the last Pog read, you led into a topic with some new gear, and I thought we were going back to a Pog read, and I was like, <laughs> man, it has not been that long yet. <laughs> uh, nope. The Pog read is right now. Why? Because I want you to have a better smelling house, car, gym bag, life in general. You need to head on over to the pogstore.com, pick up a unit that fits for your life. Wall unit, portable, fridge, whatever you need. I'm sure you can probably even get away with all three. Should you get all three? Yes, absolutely you should. You should buy all three. You should buy them for your family. You should buy them for your friends. Stocking stuffers. Stocking stuffers for everybody. What I'm saying is, chances are your relatives and friends stink and they could use some help. Go on over to thepogstore.com, join in on their 30-day odor-free challenge and kill 98% of household odors caused by bacteria and fungus. We know that the Pog listens to this podcast. We had that smoke issue here in Edmonton. Mm-hmm. We suggested that they set up a billion Pogs, mm-hmm. I take it all down, it. It did. and the me. smoke has never been mm-hmm. back again. No, exactly. I think the Pog fixed it. Thank you, Pog. Thank you, Pog. Very cool. <laughs> We've got... Less than 10 minutes left in this podcast. Got a couple of things left to cross off. First, I want to get to the Nation Draft Party that's happening tomorrow night at the Brew House in Lewis Estates. Tickets are still available at nationgear.ca. They're 10 bucks. We are raising some money for charity. We got some prizes to give away. It's going to be a good time. We are going to have a cocktail. I'm excited to see Nation fans again. Of course. It's been a minute. And Chris the Intern. Who? Allegedly. Chris the Intern said he's coming. All of his social still says the Nation Chris. I told him he could keep it. Aww. <laughs> I'm a big softie for the kid. I'm a big softie for the kid. But what I want to talk about is, uh, first thing I want to cross off is Connor McDavid did not win anything last night at the NHL Awards, finished third in heart trophy voting. Anybody surprised by that? I wasn't really surprised. I didn't expect him to. Third is kind of weird. Was it Crosby was ahead of him? Yeah, I think so. The The better story is that he finished fifth in Lady Bing voting after he got suspended. He was the most gentleman, or fifth most gentleman player in the league. Well, his suspensions are elite. Oh, hey, you know, he's probably um, a gentleman while he took it. Of course he was. Probably yeah. called, sent flowers to the guy's mother. Thank you, good time. sir, for that suspension. I was, I was looking at some of the ballots, and there's people out there that are given, like, Johnny Gaudreau and, like, Brad Marchand MVP votes over McDavid this year. What are you doing? So, it's so weird. It's just because they made the playoffs, and there's this old, unwritten rule by a bunch of dinosaurs that write articles that say, you can't be the best player if you don't make the playoffs. If McDavid it's stupid. It needs to be changed. If you took him off the Oilers, they'd win, what, three games? <laughs> so Over an 82-game season, they go 3-79? and 79? When the, Well, you got taken off the, a couple games. You got the math is right there. The <laughs> PHWA allowed people to see their ballots starting last year, correct? Yeah. Last year or the year before that. that was Do we think... Oh, when Ovechkin was both a left uh, left winger and a right winger? That was like five, six years ago. Uh, Do we think that, that again? They're, people were uh, voting for him on both sides again this year. Do we think that that's going to start to change anything, or are we just going to continue to see these? Home- like the guys are just leaning into it now. No, the, Brad Marchand getting a Lady Bing. The old writers are and still shit. fucked, and they're always going to be fucked. Someone gave Darcy Kemper an MVP vote this year. Yeah, 
You have five MVP votes and you gave him to Darcy Kemper. Maybe you gave him a signed what blocker. What are you doing? He played like 36 Maybe games for the Phoenix well, Coyotes. That's yes, because it's the local writers, right? Like Mr. Beat Reporter in Dallas is going to be like, ah, I better give Radic Fax a selkie vote. Like, are you high? Toss me, He's a, couple third sign, line center. Toss me a couple of signed sticks for there my was, kids for Christmas and I'll vote for you. There was people that didn't have Miro Heiskin in their, <laughs> in their top five rookies. There was a lot of people that didn't have Miro Heiskin in, in their top five rookies. And that dude was logging like 20 some minutes a night. Like he was insane. They gave Bennington to second place with like what twenty three games played. Miko Koskinen didn't get a single rookie he did of the have year. Like that massive. <laughs> oh, I'm not saying Bennington. I can't discount it, but he. But you're giving Bennington a vote over Heiskanen, who played an entire That's season fair. and played well, right? Ah, uh, man, it's just like the award voting is such a shit show. There's no, but there's no way to fix it. No. Nope. What do you get? Unless you want to like let the players vote on no. every award. No, but I have. Not a good I have idea. to fix. Only bloggers can vote now. Oh God. That would be even worse. No <laughs> <laughs> polls on Twitter, and that's bloggers all are just exactly. like ultimate trolls. <laughs> you run stuff. You run really, stuff through really, Twitter. Really, really and be bad. Fine. A fan vote. That's never not the worked true out, right? Test of merit isn't an award. It's um, who, 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 who? Yeah, it's the friends you made along the way. That's what matters. I don't want to win the heart who, trophy. I want to make <laughs> friends during the season. Okay, can I hit you guys? We have like four minutes Whoa, left in the yeah, podcast. You can't hit me. Can, can I hit you guys that's with assault. a question? But I, I just want one. One word answers. Does all it right? involve the Philadelphia Flyers cap situation? <laughs> no, man. So, no. Travis Konechny has scored almost 25 goals in back to back seasons. Holy. And he's 22 years old, man. That guy's getting $5 million if he wants $5 million. Look up Travis Konechny. Um, anyways, okay. <laughs> was that the early, question? Early? No, no that wasn't the I question. Won't look this, up is the question. this is the question. This is the question. Earlier in the year, we heard. He scored 24 goals last year, which is not more. Oh, than you lied. Goals last year too. Yeah, he scored twenty two back to back twenty four goal seasons, man. Brutal. Maybe a couple um, reviews in there, stole a couple from him. Okay, earlier, okay, earlier in the season, ask the question. Come on now. We heard some rumors about Nail Yakupov potentially coming back to the NHL. Who with all this Yesa Puglia Yarby yes. talk, who plays more NHL games next year? Nail Yakupov or Yesi Puglia Yarby? Puglia Yarby. Puglia Yarby. I want to say Yak, but it's Puglia Yarby, obviously. You don't think Yak's gonna come back? I think I think he'll come back, but he's not like he's not going to get a sweetheart deal for anybody. We anybody. are not going to give. He's him a not going to get the rope. No, exactly. That Puliyarv will yeah. get. He'll end up in Syracuse or something. Interesting. Hershey. If Syracuse is an NHL club. Syracuse Crunch. I thought I'd. Fire I bet up you a nail Yakupov of a signs a one-year deal with the Leafs and scores twenty goals. Can you imagine that? That was a great one. Qu- one How is Yak question. doing over on the other side of the world? Is well, he doing okay. In 47 KHL games with St. Petersburg Ska, which makes, I like to think that <laughs> they're a real just big fish or something? a mighty, mighty Boss Towns cover band. <laughs> oh, yeah. Leads them into every game, which I'm, su- you know, you never want to, never want to knock on wood. Anyway, you can't okay. give up the Ska. 23 goals and 10 assists, 33 points, 47 games in the KHL last year. So he did score some goals. He might get a look. It's going to be cheap. Fun. He's now 25 years old. Fun fact. 26 in October. Oh, sorry, Bag Milk. I keep interrupting you. If he wanted to come over as a GM, <laughs> I'd consider it. Yak? I Fun fact about Yakupov. I contacted him to be on this podcast. He said he was too far away. <laughs> no, he said he said his response was what with a space question mark. Yes, and then I explained what we were, and he said he was too far away. Who Apparently, had more it didn't points work in the KHL last year? Neil Yakupov or Timu Hardikainen? Had to be. Do I'm you have the answer? <laughs> no. Oh, <laughs> I was hoping Tyler okay. would just know off the top of his head. Okay, let's be here. let's be real here. Timu Hardikainen's probably scored twenty five goals in his past two KHL seasons. Would the Flyers give him <laughs> three and a half million a year <laughs> on a five year deal? <laughs> All right, so I have the answer. Well, what do you think? Who was it? it was Yak Timu or Hardikainen? Yes, Jesus. he did. He had Fuck seventeen yeah. goals, twenty eight assists, forty five points. Yak had more goals, less assists. He's more of a Cy Young type guy. I just want to wrap this up with. One last look at the draft party that's coming up tomorrow at the Brew House Lewis Estates. We're all going to be down there. We're going to have some prizes. We have got a return trip for two from Flair. We've got a signed Nuge jersey to give away. We've got a bunch of Nation gear. We've got stickers. We've got a bunch of GCs. It's going to be a great time. Come hang out. Come look at Dan. Come look at Dan. Just come look at him from a distance. I yeah. will be there. You can take a picture of Cam's feet. A lot of you, 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 you got to pay me for those things, buddy. Tyler's going to gonna be taking pictures of people's feet. He's starting a website. He's got a Shutterstock that you can find at Shutterstock forward slash Tyler Uramchuk feet fetish. <laughs> They're all on sale for less than $5 each. Please enjoy. I want to thank our friends at Sherwood Ford the Giant and, of course, at Pog. Go check them out at the Pog store. Racing for a Cure is coming up this weekend. 
support us through the nation team. We'll have links on social media everywhere. Enjoy the draft this weekend. Go Oilers. Go Ken Holland. We have got a very, very big offseason ahead of us, and it kind of starts tomorrow. Starts today. It kind of starts today. Starts right now. Might even start right now. Go check out Tyler's article right now about some rumors. It just got posted at OilersNation.com at 2 p.m. Mountain Standard Time. Thanks, everybody, for listening. This is Oilers Nation Radio. Have a fantastic weekend. Shout out, Damien. Best wishes.